Good morning and welcome back to our Tuesday morning Bible class from Bethlehem Lutheran Church in Menominee Falls in Germantown, Wisconsin. It's a privilege to have you joining us this morning, whether you're watching live or watching a recording on our Facebook stream or our YouTube channel. It's a pleasure to have the opportunity to study God's Word with you and be built up in our faith. Um, on Tuesday mornings, we're currently studying the book of Revelation and we are in the first major vision in the book of Revelation, which is the vision of the seven seals, uh, beginning in chapter 6, verse 1, and it runs all the way through chapter 8, verse 5. Um, <clears throat> if you're looking in our Facebook feed, there are actually two different lessons that were posted this morning. You'll need uh, lesson 6, which covers Revelation 6. We're on question number 8 of that lesson. <clears throat> so that was reposted. That's the same lesson that was, that's been posted, that was posted last week. Uh, so uh, just in case you need it again, we're on, we're on question number eight of lesson six. And then uh, God willing, we'll finish lesson six today and we'll get a start on lesson seven. So that was also a link to that was also posted on the Facebook feed. So there are actually two bit.ly links on the Facebook feed, one for Lesson 6, one for Lesson 7, and you'll need both of them if you want to follow along with us um, on the sheet. You don't have to follow along on the sheet, but if you'd like to, um, then that's, uh, that's, where they, that's where they are. <clears throat> um, we are in Revelation chapter 6, the first, the opening of the seven seals, or at least the opening of the of the first six seals. Um, and I just want to really briefly review uh, what we've gone through so far, but let's first pray. So let's begin our study with prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, you are the way, you alone are the one that takes us to the Father. Therefore, we ask in your holy name that you would be with us this morning as we study your word that you would open our eyes and our hearts to the revelation of your word, that we might see both what is going on on earth and the spiritual realm that affects this, uh, affects this world today. We ask this in all things, in your holy name. Amen. Okay, so we're in the first major vision, the vision of the seven seals. Um, and the first four seals and the vision of the seven seals are the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And so we start with um, the first, the first horseman was the, what, what, the, was the white horse, the white rider. And we talked about the difficulty of that passage. Um, it could be really one of three things. It could be Christ, it could be Antichrist, and it could be the preaching of the gospel in the world. And I uh, gave you my own reasoning for thinking that it's Antichrist but you'll find good Lutheran commentators who fall into all three camps. Um, so you can kind of decide that for yourself. Um, the second seal is the red horse, um, and the red horse represents war. Um, so it takes peace from the earth and leads people to kill each other. The third horse is the black horse, which represents famine, causing the price of food to go up and the desire of the wealthy not to harm the luxuries of oil and wine. And then the fourth horseman is the, uh, the, the word that's used in, in, your, in the NIV anyway is pale. Uh, probably a pale green is the, um, the, what we should think. And it's death. Its name is death. Um, and it strikes the earth and uh, overcomes a fourth of the, the world's inhabitants. Um, and that is, uh, we said a significant number, and yet it's less than the number that's going to be coming um, on the, for the final destruction. And then where we ended last week was the opening of the fifth seal. I just want to read those verses again, because that's where our lesson uh, picks up. We're in the discussion of this paragraph, beginning at Revelation chapter 6, verse 9, the opening of the fifth seal. When he, and remember Christ is the one that's opening these seals, the lamb that was slain but come back to life. Uh, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar 
the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. They cried out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? Then each of them was given a white robe, and they were told to wait a little longer until the full number of their fellow servants, their brothers and sisters, were killed just as they had been. So that was we. Um, that's the paragraph that we're talking about that we're in the middle of. We ended last week's um, class talking about the kind of the, the interesting theological question: um, Will we experience time in heaven? Will we experience the time between our death and the last day, um, the resurrection and the judgment of all people? And um, while there are conservative Lutheran commentators that come down on both sides of that issue, um, Luther very famously argues for um, that the moment that we don't experience time, the moment of our death is the, uh, is the moment of judgment day. Um, most modern, most uh, contemporary Lutheran commentators, uh, conservative Lutheran commentators say on the basis of this passage and then the other ones that are printed there, especially um, 2 Peter 2 and 1 Peter 3, on the basis of those passages, um, that there is, and then this passage in Revelation 6, there is going to be a, um, an experience of time. Uh, we, will, we will experience that time between our death and judgment day when we are in what we call that intermediate state uh, where our souls are in heaven but separated from our bodies as we await the, await the final resurrection um, from the dead and our souls and bodies being put back together and then we enjoy the new heavens and the new earth, um, both body and soul. So the goal of our Christian existence is not to escape the body. Um, the goal is not to become a disembodied spirit or just a soul. The ultimate goal is to have our body and our soul back to be um, to have a physical resurrection from the dead and to live forever in a new heavens and a new earth, a very physical place. Um, so uh, that was that interesting question. In the end, um, you'll kind of have to wait until you see, uh, wait, wait, w um, wait until we're there to see for sure. But um, I think on the basis of Luke 16, 2 Peter 2, 1 Peter 3, and Revelation 6, there's reason to think that we will experience that time between our death and the last day. Okay, um, but let's move on now to question number eight. What might we learn about what we can pray or should pray for from these martyrs' prayers? So it's very interesting to think about what these martyrs are praying for. They're, they, they say, how long, O sovereign Lord, how long until you judge the earth? and avenge those who killed us, uh, who spilled our blood. Uh, and this is what we call an imprecatory prayer. Um, and what that means is it's a prayer for God to act to bring judgment on his enemies, on the enemies of his people. And this is perhaps strange, sounds strange to our 21st century ears, that 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 people would be praying for the destruction of others. Um, you know, it, aren't, aren't we supposed to believe in a God of love, a God who wants everyone to be saved? Um, you know, why is it that, uh, why is it that they are praying for judgment and vengeance on those who put them to death? And this isn't the only time in the scriptures where we have this issue. Um, there are what we call imprecatory Psalms. Um, so there are entire psalms, and then there are sections of other psalms that are um, David or the, the psalmist calling on God to destroy his enemies, their enemies, or uh, depending on who, which perspective you look at it from. Um, and what's interesting, or what I think is significant, is, is a reminder that imprecatory prayers not only are okay, it's not only that imprecatory prayers are allowed, but that imprecatory prayers are necessary. Um, it is actually necessary that we pray for the destruction of the enemy's kingdom, um, that, we, that we pray for 
the end or the frustration of all those who try to um, frustrate God's plan. There's a very famous um, quotation from Mark from a letter that Martin Luther wrote called uh, he the well in our letters in our, in our collection of of letters it's called against the assassin at Dresden. Um, but this is uh, and but this is specifically Martin Luther's answer to the question about imprecatory prayers. You know, is it okay for us to pray for the destruction of our enemies? Um, and this is what Luther says. He says, I cannot pray without cursing at the same time. If I say, hallowed be your name, I must therefore or thereby say, may the names of all the papists and those who blaspheme you be accursed, condemned, and dishonored. If I say your kingdom come, I must thereby say, may the papacy together with all kingdoms on earth that are opposed to your kingdom be accursed, condemned, and destroyed. If I say your will be done, I must thereby say, may the plot, plans and plots of the papists and all who strive against your will be accursed, condemned, dishonored, and brought to naught. Truly, thus my lips and my heart pray day in and day out, that all who believe in Christ are praying this way with me. So I want you to recognize the argument that, that Luther is making here, which is that there is a sense in which every single Christian prayer is an imprecatory prayer. To pray for God's kingdom is to pray against anything that seeks to fr frustrate God's kingdom. So whether you actually put it in terms of an imprecatory prayer or not, like the saints of Revelation 6, um, even if you're only praying the positive side, you know, thy kingdom come, th thy will be done, they, nevertheless you are praying that God would frustrate the work of his enemies and those who are who are working against the, um, the building up and, and success of the kingdom. Um, so I just think it's interesting for us um, to, re to remember that. I'm not saying, I'm not trying to suggest that our prayer lives should be 100% imprecatory prayers. Um, but there is a place, there is a place in the Christian's life um, to cry out to God for justice. There is a place in the Christian life to cry out to God for vengeance upon those who are working against, striving against, and frustrating um, the will of God in the world. Just remember that, um, that it is God's vengeance. That's not ours. It's not our job to seek vengeance. In fact, we're explicitly forbidden from seeking vengeance. Um, but, God, um, but God tells us there will be a day when all the scales will be balanced and every, right, every wrong will be made right, um, where his people will be vindicated and his enemies will be condemned. And so we entrust that vengeance into God's hands, just like the saints of Revelation 6 are doing. That brings up kind of a whole other question, though, which is... Um, why do we pray imprecatory prayers so little? Why are imprecatory prayers kind of so foreign to us? Um, why is it that we don't pray for the judgment against our enemies very often? And I think the reason is because, to be honest with you, we don't really have that many enemies, at least in the world. Um, there aren't people out there who are cutting off the heads of Bethlehem members on a daily basis. If there were people out there who were kidnapping our members and putting them to death, then I think we would very quickly have more imprecatory prayers. We would, we would ask that God would avenge the blood of our brothers and sisters who are being put to death and that he would um, stop those the will of the uh, of those kidnappers, and he would frustrate their ability to do those things. So perhaps the reason why imprecatory prayers don't come very naturally to us, whereas they they would have come more naturally to David or to the psalmists or to the saints of Revelation, um, is because we don't necessarily have the enemies that they have today. Uh, uh, that we have the enemies that they had today. That we don't have them today. At least we don't have the kind of physical persecution that the people, um, the saints of the past, had to had to undergo. Um, so, and uh, Dr. Bruegs kind of one of his state one of his favorite things to say was, 
it's hard to pray an imprecatory prayer from a padded pew. When things are nice and comfortable, when your life is nice and comfortable, um, it, then imprecatory prayers against your enemies don't necessarily seem all that appealing or necessary because, um, after all, everything's pretty good. Everything's working out. Um, why, why would I pray such kind of a negative prayer? So um, the day may come um, in our lives, in our lives of faith, where imprecatory prayers will become more, uh, more fervent or more prevalent in, in our prayer lives, in our corporate prayer life. Um, but uh, for now, I just want you to, to recognize that it isn't wrong to pray imprecatory prayers. Um, that it is, there's nothing wrong with praying that God would frustrate the plans of those who are working against his kingdom. There's nothing wrong with praying for God's vengeance upon those who seek to frustrate the work of his kingdom. Uh, and that there is a sense in which every time we pray, I think every, especially every time we pray the Lord's Prayer, we are really making imprecatory requests because to say thy kingdom come means to frustrate anything that goes against his kingdom. And to say hallowed be your name means to go against anything that would that treats his name as less than holy. Isn't there a difference in God, or like when we're talking about how God is doing this, between God's vengeance and God's justice? So Rachel's question is, is there a, dis a difference between God's vengeance and God's justice. And I don't necessarily think that I would make a strong case, a, a strong differentiation between the two. I use the word vengeance here because that's the word the saints use, right? How long, O Lord, a sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood. So that's where the word vengeance comes from, is avenge. Um, maybe, maybe one... <clears throat> Maybe if I if, if I if you wanted me to make a difference between the two, justice is a, is a, is bigger than vengeance. Vengeance is a subcategory of justice, um, because justice also includes the declaring not guilty of his people. Right? It is um, just that God would declare his people not guilty for the sake of Christ, and it is just that he would bring vengeance upon those people. Um, who rejected Christ. So vengeance is justice aimed at the unrighteous. But just the concept of justice covers both the righteous and the unrighteous. Okay. Um, but if you want, but, you know, practically speaking, if you wanted to talk about God's justice, if you were just talking about more imprecatory type prayers and you were asking that God would bring justice to the earth, and you wanted to kind of use, you were using that as kind of a synonym for vengeance, I, that would be fine. I'm not, there wouldn't anything, there wouldn't be anything wrong with that. Because um, vengeance really is kind of a subset of justice. Okay, so that's the fifth seal, the souls under the altar. So the first four seals of the four writers of the apocalypse. The fifth seal is the souls under the altar. Let's go ahead and look at the sixth seal, which is Judgment Day. The sixth seal describes Judgment Day. So Revelation chapter 6, verses 12 to 17. I watched as he opened the sixth seal. Again, he is Christ, the only one who's worthy to open the seals. I watched as he opened the sixth seal. There was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair. The whole moon turned blood red, and the stars in the sky fell to earth as figs drop from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. The heavens receded like a scroll being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and everyone else, both slave and free, hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. Then they called to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can withstand it? Okay, so um, 
so I just um, number 10 according to Revelation 6 especially verse 17 show how the following statement is incomplete and here's the statement judgment day is the day on which God the Father will rage against all unbelievers now the statement is true and in in and of itself or at least it's it's understandable in and of itself but it's incomplete because when the the people of the earth and remember that so that's a a way of talking about the unrighteous those who belong to the earth not to heaven but um the unrighteous the the unbelievers when they when they call on the rocks and the mountains to hide them they're calling from the rocks and the mountains to fight to hide them from the face of him who sits on the throne so that's god the father and from the wrath of the lamb that's god the son and sometimes it it um, troubles christians to think about the fact that on the last day christ is going to be wrathful because we tend to think about jesus as being save, saving you know we think about jesus so sweet or jesus so mild um you know the savior who um prays father forgive them they do not know what they are doing when he's crucified um you know a, a, like a lamb before its shears is silent so he did not open his mouth that that kind of thing um or first peter he did not respond to his enemies taunts with his own um so uh but remember that there's a big difference between jesus first coming when he comes to win salvation and his second coming when we talk about the second coming of jesus think about every time we confess our faith and either the apostles or nicene creed every time we confess our faith that he will come again to judge the living and the dead and for those who have rejected him that judgment is not going to be pleasant uh, that judgment that he's going to come with his wrath um, that the that there will be those who fear the wrath of the lamb now you and i don't need to be afraid of the wrath of the lamb because um, the lamb is our good shepherd right the lamb is also this um, the savior who loves us he is Oh, Jesus, so sweet. Oh, Jesus, so mild. Um, uh, he, he loves us for his own sake, for the sake of his own sacrifice. But um, that isn't going to be the case for all people. That isn't going to be the case for those who have rejected him. Um, they are going to have to wrestle with, uh, um, with the reality um, that Christ um, is not just a merciful Savior, but he's also a judging Savior. Um, and I have here, um, read also uh, John 5, 22 and 23. And these are the words of Jesus. So if you had a red letter Bible, these words would be in red. I happen to not have one. Um, but these are the words of Jesus. And he said, so, and Jesus says, Moreover, the Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Anyone who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. So this passage talks about how the Father actually entrusts judgment to the Son. And that's why we put that phrase, he will come to judge the living and the dead. It's why we put it in the second article of the Apostles' Creed, not the first article. The first article talks about the work of God the Father. The second article talks about the work of God the Son. And sidebar, the third article talks about the work of the Holy Spirit. There's a reason why we put he will come again to judge the living and the dead in that second article, um, because he, um, all judgment has been entrusted to him. Again, judgment has two sides. This is like the difference between justice and vengeance. Um, judgment has two sides. You and I don't need to be afraid of the judgment because we already know what judgment we're going to get. We get the judgment of not guilty. We get the judgment of having been declared righteous in God's sight for the sake of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. So you and I actually can welcome the judgment. You and I can actually be, we can look forward to and be eager to receive the judgment because we know what judgment we're going to receive. Um, but again, that isn't going to be the case for everyone. 
Um, and uh, so this is just a reminder to us. We want to have a full picture of who Jesus is. Um, we don't want to turn Jesus into something less than he is. I had one of my, one of my um, very first ca uh, catechism students, when I first got out of the ministry, like to call hippie Jesus or California Jesus. Kind of this, you know, the Jesus who just says peace and, and you know, everything is going to be okay. Um, that, you know, that, that kind of um, Jesus, the, a Jesus that is okay with sin, a Jesus that, you know, just kind of overlooks sin and takes all things um, and just kind of says, well, it'll all be okay. You know, I'll take care of all that. Um, but, but my message is peace and love. Um, that, but, and, and it is, but it isn't only that. It's also justice and judgment. Um, so uh, we don't want to take Jesus for granted. We don't want to have a limited picture of Jesus. We want to have the full picture of him, lest we begin to take him for granted, um, lest we begin to, um, to have less than a full respect, um, kind of the fear, love, and trust for Jesus that we're supposed to have. And then the last question that I have here is the chapter ends with a question. Is it a rhetorical question or not? And I think in the, um, in the flow of the story, in the flow of the narrative, I, obviously I think it is a rhetorical question. Um, uh, especially as it's coming, it's coming out of the lips of the unrighteous. Right. In other words, um, a rhetorical question is an answer, a question whose answer is so obvious that it doesn't even need to be answered. Um, and that is the case when that when those when this question, this question is that in the chapter ends on is coming out of the mouth of an unbeliever. Um, the, for the great day of their wrath has come and who can withstand it? And of course, the answer to that question is no unbeliever can withstand it. There is no unbeliever who's able to escape the day of judgment, who's able to, you know, um, who's able to, ha to be able to hide um, from the wrath of the Lamb. What I think is interesting, though, is that when you put Revelation 6 and 7 together, what's very interesting is that immediately after this question, um, we have this interlude that describes those who escape from or withstand the judgment. We're going to we're going to talk about those who are saved. We're going to talk about the righteous. And of course, remember that the chapter divisions that we have in our Bible are not original. Um, that they're not a part of the Greek text. Um, when when John wrote the apocalypse, he didn't divide it up into chapters. That was something that was done much later. Um, and just to make it easier for us to get around and to make references in our Bibles. Um, so uh, in, in the original text, and you know, it just in, in the Greek text, you just have, for the great day of their wrath has come and who can withstand it? And then right, right after that, after this, I saw four angels and, and this is going to describe the 144,000. So, um, just, uh, uh, it is an interesting question. It's a kind of a, um, I think is a rhetorical question. It is in, in, I think in the original text in the flow of the, of chapter six, it is. But on the other hand, I think that in a very real way, revelation seven answers the question of revelation six, that it ends on this great question, who can withstand it? And then God gives us the answer. The 144,000 can withstand it. Um, we're going to get this picture of the 144,000 that, that actually can withstand the wrath of the Lamb because of the sacrifice of Jesus. Okay, so that brings our study of the opening of the six, first six seals of the vision of the seven seals to a close. So I do want to give you a chance here to ask any questions that you might have um, about the seven seals uh, and about what they mean or represent or um, how they apply to our lives and our world today. And while you're doing that, I'm going to pull up Lesson 7, um, which is um, the Vision of the Seven Seals Part 2, 
Um, or another way of thinking about it, 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 it is an interlude in the vision of the seven seals. So chapter 7, verse 1 is not the opening of the seventh seal. That doesn't come until chapter 8, verse 6. Um, that is the opening of the, or sorry, chapter 8, verse 1 is the opening of the seventh seal. So chapter 7 is not the opening of the seventh seal. Chapter 7 is an interlude. Um, chapter 7 is actually a flashback. And we're going to talk about why that is. We're going to talk about how do we how we know that is here in a second. All right, no questions are coming in, though. If you are typing a question, then please go ahead and finish it and press enter, and then we will circle back and pick it up. Um, so um, that that concludes our studying of, this, of the opening of the six seals. If you open up... Um, the new lesson, lesson seven, the vision of the seven seals, part two, Revelation seven, verses one to eight, five. At the very top, um, just like in the last lesson, I have a little um, review or a little outline of where we are so far in the book. So Revelation chapters one through three, you can think of as being a prologue or an introduction to the book um, where we have the commissioning vision. Remember that vision of Jesus that John sees um, that's going to come up with the des descriptions that are going to be used in the seven letters to the seven churches. And then chapters two and three are the seven letters to the seven churches. So Revelation 1 through 3 is kind of the prologue or the introduction to the book of Revelation. And then verses four, uh, chapters 4 and 5, I have them here called an interlude. Um, partly because we're going to see this is something that's very common in the book of Revelation, that there in the visions there are interludes. At the time, I suggested that we ought to see chapters 4 and 5 as a transition. Um, they're kind of a transition chap chapters in the sense that they, they kind of simultaneously look backward into chapters 1 and 3 and forward into the first opening of the first, uh, of the first vision, the seven seals. And then... Um, we are right now in the middle, just about exactly in the middle, of the first major vision, the opening of the seven seals. So, um, but we, what we are looking at um, today, Revelation 7, is a flashback. and It's an interlude, but it's not just an interlude. It's not just a stopping of the events um, that's, uh, uh, that are related by the opening of the six seals, if you want to, you know, the seventh seal's coming. Um, if you want to think of it that way, it isn't just a stop, it isn't just a taking a break from the opening of the seven seals. It's actually a flashback to something that happens before the opening of the sixth seal. Okay, um, so, but let's go ahead and read Revelation chapter 1 verses, well, let's just do 1 to 8. Okay, let's just do 1 to 8 and then we'll kind of Pick, we'll kind of come back and um, pick up verses 9 to 12. So here's Revelation 7, beginning at verse 1. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds on the earth to prevent any wind from blowing on the land or on the sea or on any tree. Then I saw another angel coming up from the east, Having the seal of the living God, he called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea. So that's interesting. Um, notice that at the beginning of the, or the first verse, they're described as those who are holding back the winds. Um, but now we learn why they're holding them back. They are, they are eventually going to be the ones who strike the earth. Um, with, with these winds. They're just not ready to do it yet. So here's the voice um, the voice of the other quote-unquote angel, um, that uh, the angel who's sealed with the seal of the living God. Um, this is what he says to those four angels who are holding back the winds of the earth. He says, Do not harm the land of the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. Then I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 from the tribes of Israel, from all the tribes of Israel. 
from the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. From the tribe of Reuben, 12,000. From the tribe of Gad, 12,000. From the tribe of Asher, 12,000. From the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000. From the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000. From the tribe of Simeon, 12,000. From the tribe of Levi, 12,000. From the tribe of Issachar, 12,000. From the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000. From the tribe of Joseph, 12,000. From the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000. Okay, so interesting things going on here. First, um, what do, um, how do we know that the events described in these verses are a flashback? Um, and the answer is to compare Revelation 7, 1 to 3, especially 3, where the quote-unquote mighty angel, now why do, you, why do I keep saying quote-unquote mighty angel? Um, there are many people who think that this angel is Christ. This third, the, the fifth angel, so to speak, um, is Christ. Um, and part of the reason for that is because he has the seal of the living God, which might be um, that, in other words, that could be, that could mean that he is God, that he has the seal of the living God. In other words, um, if you think, especially if you think about what seals were in the ancient world, um, you know, um, it was very common for a, a ruler, uh, an ancient Near Eastern ruler, to carry their seal on a long chain or a long um, necklace, or maybe a leather thong, that kind of a thing, around their neck, and um, and it was like a cylinder, and on the cylinder was their seal, and whenever they wanted to seal something, maybe they were sealing an envelope, or if they were if they had written an official document and they were going to add their seal to the bottom of it, um, so you would drip wax on it. And then the the ruler would take his seal and roll it in the in the hot wax, the warm wax, and the and it would have it would have the king's it would the the document would then um, bear the king's seal, and that's how you knew it had actually come from the king, because the only one who had a copy of a seal um, was the king, and he always had it with him. He always wore it around his neck. He didn't give copies of it to his um, to his uh, lessers, right? So if he has the seal, the question is, is he wearing the seal? In other words, has the seal been put upon him? Which is what seems to happen for the 144,000. God puts his seal on them. So um, so we bear the seal of, um, we have had that that seal put on onto us. Or does he have the seal in the sense that he's carrying the seal, um, that he has the like, he, like he's wearing the seal around his neck because the seal belongs to him? So one of the great questions, and we can't say for sure. This isn't the first time that we're going to have this, where we have a mighty angel and we can't say for sure whether it's Christ or an angel, um, uh, maybe an archangel or something like that. But uh, this is the first the first of those examples. Whether we maybe it's uh, maybe it's Christ, maybe it's an archangel. It doesn't really matter in the end. Um, but um, I tend to think it's Christ. I, I like to think it's Christ here. Um, uh, the other piece of evidence that it's Christ is that Christ, that the, this fifth angel is giving commands. Now, does that does that seal it? Is it possible that the archangels can give commands to lesser angels? Sure. I think that's very possible. So, um, but uh, it is fitting, you know, it would be appropriate if the one who is commanding the angels to withhold the destruction on the earth is God, is true God. So that would be another maybe piece of evidence that you would try to weigh into the into the balance one way or the other. Okay, but anyway. How do we know it's a flashback? When you compare um, Revelation 7, 1 to 3 to Revelation 6, 12 to 14, but if you go back to 6, 12 to 14, that is the opening of the sixth seal, which is judgment day. It's the destruction of the earth, right? Um, the, um, the sun turns black, the moon turns red, the stars fall from the sky, the heavens are rolled back like a scroll, and every mountain and island is removed from its place. That's all Judgment Day language. That's all um, destruction of the world before the remaking new heavens and new earth, right? So um, 
But in chapter 7, verses 1 to 3, none of that has happened yet. The four angels are holding back the winds that are going to cause that to happen. So um, this is how we know that chapter seven, one, um, chapter 7 is a flashback. And it's a flashback to some time before the opening of the sixth scroll, of a sixth seal, sorry, the opening of the sixth seal. I tend to think it flashes back to the time between the opening of the fifth seal and the opening of the sixth seal, because remember the opening of the fifth seal is the is the seeing the altars of the soul and he, souls in heaven, the souls in heaven underneath the altar, um, and so you have in, in the fifth seal you have heaven the the saints of God in heaven described, and in the interlude you have the saints of God in heaven described. So I, in my mind, I tend to think about the interlude and the fifth seal as going together. But um, the big thing I want to just point out or, or make sure that we understand or recognize is that Revelation 7 is a flashback before the opening of the sixth seal. Now, um, why is that significant? One of the reasons it's significant, first of all, it just, um, it just helps us understand the flow of the text. But one of the, the, the big lessons that we have to remember before, um, when we're reading the book of Revelation is that the book of Revelation is not chronologically arranged. And we, we talked about this in our introductory lesson, um, especially for those of you who, when we were still meeting, it seems like a long time ago that we were meeting on Tuesday mornings in person. Um, but if you remember when we were meeting in person um, and we did our introduction to this, to, to the book of Revelation, one of the things that we said was that Revelation is not a line. It's not, it's not a story that starts at the beginning of, of the book and then the story ends at the end of the book. It's a loop. Um, it's, a, it's, it's one story that repeats seven times. And so the, the book of Revelation, more than any other book of the Bible, is non-chronological. And so you might say, well, how am I supposed to, to handle this? How, you know, um, it it kind of breaks our Western minds that, that, that there would be a flashback like this. Um, but what I just want you to rem remember is that more than any other book of, of the Bible, Revelation is not chronological. Um, and so you really got to pay attention to details like this, like, like chapter 7, verses 1 to 3, um, being before the destruction of the world, coming right after a section where there is the destruction of the world. And so there is the, that's how we know that these verses are a flashback. Okay. Um, number two, why is the action of the world's destruction interrupted? What does this flashback teach us about the terrifying events of the last day? So um, what, what I think is interesting about this, and we're going to see this um, several times, that the opening of the, uh, or whatever, the, there's an interlude be, um, at significant times. Um, so what does the flashback teach us about the terrifying events of the last day? Well, the, the flashback is going to teach us how important it is to be, be, to be prepared for the coming of that day. There are only two groups of people. There's either the group of people who call on the mountains of the rocks, fall on me and hide me from the wrath of the Lamb, or... There's the 144,000 who are sealed um, and belong to God and who are going to get this beautiful description of, of heaven that we have in Revelation 7, which is very often read either at funerals or at gravesides. Um, so uh, it's just a reminder to us, the flashback is a reminder to us that if um, you can't wait until the opening of the sixth seal to get right with God. Um, the, by the time the sixth seal is opened, it's too late. It's too late to get right with God. The time to get right with God is before the opening of the sixth seal. The time to get right with God is right now. The time to be right with God is right now. Um, it is, so long as it is called today, the right of the Hebrews, I'm quoting Psalm 95, is going to remind us. Um, <clears throat> So I think that's kind of an interesting point or an interesting thing to, to, to think about or be reminded of. It's a very important biblical concept 
Nobody teaches it more clearly than Jesus um, or emphasizes it more than does Jesus, um, that he's going to come like a thief in the night and therefore we must be ready um, to receive him at any time. Think about the parable of the 12 virgins, right? Um, that six had the lamp oil and six didn't. Six were ready for the coming of the bridegroom and six were not. Um, and we want to make sure that we're among the virgin, we're among those who are ready, um, who are watching for the coming of our bridegroom. Okay. Um, let's... Keep going now with um, question number three, agree or disagree. Revelation 7, 4, and I guess I could really say 7, 4 through 8, teaches us that a total of 140,000 Jewish believers will be in heaven. And in your answer, be sure to include Revelation 9. Now, that's kind of not fair because I haven't read Revelation 9 yet. So let's go ahead at this point and read Revelation 9 to 12. After this, I looked. And there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, they fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. So, um, agree or disagree, Revelation 7, 4 teaches us there will be a total of 144,000 Jewish believers in heaven. Hopefully by now you know to disagree that in the book of Revelation, when you see a number, your very first thought is to ask yourself, could this be an apocalyptic number? Could this be a symbolic number? So remember your symbolic numbers are 3, 4, 6, 7, 10, and 12. Okay, 3, 4, 6, 7, 10, and 12. And you look at this number and you see, wait a second, this is the number 12 times the number 12, 144, times 10 times 10 times 10. Um, and uh, the number for the number 12 represents the number for the church. Number 10 is the number for perfection. And so you've got the number of number 12 times 12, the Old Testament church and the New Testament church um, times 10 times 10 times 10. It's the perfect Old Testament and New Testament church. The perfect times perfect times perfect Old Testament, New Testament church. And it is described in chapter uh, in verse 9 as being so many people that it cannot be counted. So I want you to think about the dichotomy here, that in, in verses 5, or I guess verse 4 through 8, there the number are counted, the number are 144,000. But in verse 9, the number is uncountable. Um, there is so many there that they can't be counted. And notice that they aren't just from Israel. They're from every nation, tribe, people, and language. Um, so, uh, what, what we, what we have going on in the 144,000 is, uh, is, um, a symbolic number and a, a symbolic number for all those who are in heaven. Okay. Um, there is, I just have a little note here that the 12, the list of the 12 tribes of Israel is unlike any such list found in the old Testament. Um, Ephraim is replaced by Joseph while Manasseh, the other brother of Joseph, remains. So that's, that is weird um, that Joseph and his brother um, are there. Um, Dan is replaced with Levi, which is weird because Levi doesn't get an, an inheritance in the promised land, at least not his own, uh, their own area. They get cities spread throughout the, the Holy Land. Um, so the, Levit the Levitical cities. Um, so if this list is supposed to represent the sum total of Jewish believers in heaven, why is Dan left out? Um, now, there might be an answer there in Hebrews 11, verse 32, but um, the one of the things I just want to say is that this list of the 12 tribes of Israel is, is unique, it's different, and we don't have any explanation as to why it's different. I got a question once, I, I remember 
um, receiving a question once, an email question, um, asking, and that the person was reading Revelation on their own, and they had done a good job. They had found all the list of the twelve tribes of Israel in the Bible, and they um, and they had put them all together for me, and they said, "Why is Revelation different? Why is the why is the list of the twelve tribes in Revelation different than any any of the Old Testament list of the twelve tribes of Israel?" And I pulled off the shelf every Revelation commentary that I have. And basically, um, either those commentaries don't say anything about the list of the 12 tribes, or what they say is, we haven't got a clue what the significance of the 12 tribes, um, of, of why the 12 tribes are the, um, listed the way they are here in Revelation 7. So one of the things that I'd like to talk about, though, and we'll kind of end on this today, is that there are many conservative evangelicals, though so many conservative Christians who, in a lot of ways, um, are the people that we're closest to theologically. Of course, the group that we are closest to theologically are our confessional brothers and sisters in um, the Missouri Synod. Um, but, uh, well, you know, after the brothers and sisters in the ELS with whom we're in fellowship. But, um, when you're thinking about a much bigger church body, what closest that we have in common um, is with our other confessional Lutherans. But um, beyond that, usually really conservative evangelicals are the ones that we are closest to, um, especially in moral matters, especially in, you know, in things like um, God's definition of marriage or the sanctity of life um, or th those kinds of things. So, um, it's it's uh, it's important for us to um, be aware when there is a very important difference between Lutheranism and, and evangelicalism, so that we're not pulled into thinking that there are no differences. Yes, there are lots of things that we have in common. Um, even doctrinally, there are lots of things we have in common. A conservative evangelical is going to be believe that Christ is the only way to get to heaven. Believing in Jesus is the only way to get to heaven. And that Jesus is true God, that he was born of a virgin, that, that God is triune, um, that there's going to be a, a, a judgment day. All those things are things that conservative evangelicals would share our faith about. Um, but when you, when you, but that's what makes it, I think that's what makes it especially important when we come across an issue where what we believe is different from what a conservative evangelical believes, that we talk a little bit about that lest we begin to think that there isn't a difference between Lutheranism and evangelicalism. There is, there, there are important differences. The most important differences have to do with conversion um, and um, conversion, election, um, and the means of grace, right? Um, so how does a person come to faith? Do they make a decision or not? Election, who is elected um, to salvation? Are the, are the, um, are believers elected or are just for salvation or are believers selected for salvation and unbelievers elected for damnation? That's not what we believe, um, but it's what most conservative evangelicals believe. Um, and then the means of grace, um, the, most evangelicals believe that baptism and the Lord's Supper is, are just symbols, right? They're just symbols of salvation. They don't actually give salvation. And that's why they don't baptize infants. That's why they um, when they, they only celebrate, maybe they only celebrate the Lord's Supper once a month or once every three months, because it just really isn't that important to them. Um, it just, uh, because it's just an outward symbol of, of uh, another reality. So, um, I just lost my study here, so... Um, so one of the things that I um, what I want one of the things that's unique about this um, is or one of the things that I want to talk about is that they're based um, partly on this passage, partly on the passage on, on the basis of Revelation seven. It's very common among conservative evangelicals to believe that in the end, all Jewish people will be saved because they're Jewish people. Now, there are two brands of this. There's one brand that says that all Jewish people of all time will be saved. Most confessional or most conservative evangelicals don't believe that. 
In other words, most confessional or conservative evangelicals believe that those Jewish people who have rejected Christ during their earthly lives are not going to be saved. But um, it is much more common among conservative evangelicals to believe that at the, at the second coming of Jesus, all the Jewish people on the face of the earth will be saved. And on the basis, and one of the passages that they'll point to for that is this passage from um, Revelation 7. Though really they base it um, more, more so on this passage from Romans eleven twenty five 25 to 26, where Paul writes, I do not want you to be ignorant of the mystery, brothers and, and sisters, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced the hardening in part until the full number of Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved. And so they take that phrase, and so all Israel will be saved. And they think that means that on the last day, every Jewish person, every member of Israel is going to be saved. And what we're going to do next week, where we're going to start next week is with this, um, with the discussion of this issue. And we're going to look at the other things the Bible says. Um, of the, the, the passages that we would, we would say um, are reasons why we, we wouldn't believe that um, all Jews are going to be saved in the last day just because they're Jews. Believing Jews will be saved in the last day. In other words, Jewish people who believe in Jesus as their Savior are going to be saved in the last day. But um, not all Jewish people of all time, and cer um, certainly not that. And then um, not all Jewish people who are, just happen to be alive because they're Jewish people at the second coming. So we want to take a few moments to read and think through and comment on each one of these passages that helps us understand um, who Israel really is. What does Paul mean when he says, not all is, and, and so all Israel will be saved? Um, who is this Israel and how are they saved? So I um, don't have time to look at that today, so we'll start with that next week. I'd like to thank you for joining us um, this morning. It's been a privilege to study God's Word and uh, be built up in our faith, uh, look at some interesting uh, questions and issues from Revelation. Um, and we'll start next week with Revelation 7, um, and that'll probably give us enough to worry about um, next week. So, but let's close with the blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with us always. Amen. Thank you very much. I hope to see you again soon from our live streaming ministry at Bethlehem Lutheran Church in Menominee Falls in Germantown, Wisconsin.